Welcome to the John M. Burns Conference on the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, which is sponsored by the Te Texas Tech University Teaching Academy. I am Angela Lumpkin. I'm professor and department chair for the Department of Kinesiology and Sport Management. And this year, I have the privilege and honor to serve as chair of the Executive Council of the Teaching Academy. On behalf of the Teaching Academy, I want to express our sincere appreciation and thanks to everyone who was able to join us this morning and will be joining us later this afternoon for the student panel and the faculty lightning round. Since we cannot literally feed you lunch today, we've decided instead to fill you with our, uh, some sharing of experiences, insights, and insights about adapting our teaching during the pandemic. A little historical context for our conference. This conference honors the name and legacy of John M. Burns. Dr. Burns began as an assistant professor of biological sciences in 1969. He authored more than 60 publications and obtained over $3 million in grants. Dr. Burns served as department chair for biological sciences between 1987 and 1995. He then served as Vice Provost of Academic Affairs. After becoming Interim Provost in 1966, he then served as Provost from 1997 to 2002. He retired, life was good, then TTU convinced him to come out of his retirement to serve as Interim Dean of Kasner. He did such a great job, then he was named the Permanent Dean of Kasner in 2008. He tried again to retire in 2011 and this time it was successful. Dr. Burns was the founding director of the TTU Howard Hughes Medical Institute program and the Clark Scholars program. Dr. Burns spearheaded the founding of the Texas Tech University Teaching Academy in 1997. Dr. Burns valued teaching. The Teaching Academy through today's conference stands on his shoulders to continue to value and advance teaching excellence. This would be a great opportunity to clap, send a high five, whatever you'd like to in appreciation to Dr. Burns. Normally in the past, he's been able to join us and he cannot anymore, but we, we are grateful and that I intentionally use that language of standing on his shoulders because that's exactly what we do. The Teaching, Learning, and Professional Development Center has been a partner in sponsoring the Burns Conference since 2006. The 2020 Burns Conference planning team included Bob McDonald, past chair of the Executive Council, Patrick Hughes, and Suzanne Tapp, plus other members of the Teaching Academy Executive Council who helped make decisions about format and themes. The Burns Conference typically brings in this outstanding external speaker to Texas Tech for a meeting like today. However, this year, in case you hadn't noticed, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. And, but this pandemic gives us the opportunity, the silver lining, if you will, to use this year's Burns Conference to highlight some of the expertise on our own campus as they share their teaching experience and their words of wisdom. As you saw in the advertisements, Today's Burns Conference will feature three sessions. We'll begin with a faculty panel that you'll learn more about in a second, starting shortly. Then there'll be a student panel between 1 and 2 p.m. this afternoon, and then a lightning round of short, quick faculty presentations starting at 2. Time out, we need to have a few housekeeping items to get everybody on the same page. You might notice that we have a rather long break. That would have been the period of time in which we'd served a delicious lunch and we would have been able to observe and, and learn from the posters of the recipients of the Lawrence Skovanek Teaching Development Scholarship. Oops, can't do that. Tangentially, I might mention that a lot of those that have been able to attend their conferences thus far will be sharing some of their expertise in some podcasts and webinars. So be sure and Check the Teaching Academy website for that information. You also uh, will notice that we're meeting through Zoom 
and um, this particular link will be the same all day. But we also know that we've been in enough Zoom meetings the past several months to know that Zoom fatigue, Fanny fatigue, is a very real phenomenon for us and for our students. So we encourage you to take a break at the end of the three presentations this morning. Go stretch, walk around the block, eat lunch, take a break, do yoga, but come back at one o'clock for the afternoon, two hours, uh, two different sessions, students and then faculty. So again, if you leave the meeting, don't worry about it, save that link you can use that same link to connect with us this afternoon. At this time, I would like to ask you to, and I think most people already have, but please mute your microphones. And we ask that the questions that you will have for our, our three panelists this morning, if you will post those in the chat feature that's down at the bottom of your screen, we have a moderator that will moderate that and, and check for those questions so that our panelists have the opportunity to respond to all of your questions. It is now my pleasure to introduce our outstanding TLPDC Executive Director, Suzanne Tapp, who will introduce our first session. Thank you, Angela, I appreciate that. It is a treat today to introduce our faculty panel titled Adjusting to Teaching in a Global Pandemic. We have three wonderful faculty members sharing their own experiences today, and let me introduce them to you. Dr. Melinda Caldwell is a professor in human development and family sciences. Dr. Justin Hart is associate professor in the Department of History. Dr. Chris Smith is professor and chair of musicology and the founding director of the Vernacular Music Center. In our discussion today, the panelists will address issues of achieving learning outcomes, adapting content or assessment strategies, engaging and caring for students in the midst of these changing times. They'll share their reflections about their overall experiences as related to teaching and ways in which they may be even changed for the better. Our goal today is to highlight their experiences, the positive takeaways, the challenges, the emotions, uh, their thoughts and changes, and to allow you, our audience members, to reflect on your own experiences as you listen along. Our thought is that we'll give each panelist 15 minutes or so to share their reflections about their experiences in the pivot from the spring to remote learning and many changes, shifts to online learning in the fall. Some of our panelists may use PowerPoints um, as visuals. They'll share their screens at the appropriate time. We again invite you to place questions in the chat feature. I'll be keeping track, taking note of those questions, and I'll make sure that our panelists are aware of those. After our initial presentations are finished, we'll take a few moments to allow panelists to reflect on each other's comments, and then we'll open it up for Q&A, and I'll share those questions with our panelists and see what they have to say. So we're going to go alphabetical. We're going to start this morning with Dr. Caldwell. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, in a more systematic way, think about what this pivot has meant for me and for students um, and for my teaching overall, my approach to teaching overall. Um, I do think that my teaching, I'll just sort of cut to an end message that I do think that my teaching has uh, improved in many ways throughout the course of this pandemic even though it's been hard and exhausting, which I think many people can relate to. A big part of my teaching philosophy is grounded in the idea that to be an effective teacher, I need to be my authentic self. And this is an idea that is partly rooted in some of the work and writing of uh, Parker J. Palmer. And one of the quotes that he has that, I, that resonates with me often is, as I teach, I project the condition of my soul onto my students, my subject, and my way of being together. And I really view the importance of being authentic is that I think it does set the tone for what happens um, in the classroom, whether it's happening face-to-face -face or virtually or online. And I'll be very honest with you that the idea of being authentic in my teaching is sometimes really challenging to me. It's not something that comes particularly easily or that I always do very well even though it is a very core principle for me in terms of teaching. 
And I've actually thought about this idea of authenticity a lot since March, because I think in some ways it's been easier to be authentic in the context of the pandemic, because everybody's just a little bit off. Like everybody's experience is different than it has been and everybody's having to do different things. Um, but it also has still been challenging to me in some ways. So I wanted to share this morning a little bit about some of the changes that happened um, in the spring semester and how that's influenced some of the things that I'm doing this fall in my teaching. In the spring, I was teaching an undergraduate theories of human development and families class. And the announcement about the shutdown came the Thursday before spring break, uh, right before I went into my class. And um, so I didn't have a lot of time to think about what exactly I was gonna do. I didn't have information or specifics for my students. And I think that was a great opportunity actually to be authentic because I took all of my uncertainties into the classroom and said, so did you get the email? So this is a thing and it's happening. And what does this mean for us? And I really spent most of that class period entertaining questions, the vast majority to which I had no answers, like none, right? How long will this last? Will we be back in a couple of weeks? What are we gonna do about that one assignment? What do I do about this? Like we were gonna do a presentation. And I was like, I, I've got nothing. Um, but I think, I think it was really, I really appreciate that I had that opportunity to connect with my students before we went online because I really did want to hear what they were thinking about and what they were worried about and kind of, you know, get a quick read on where they were. And as we ended class that day, I told them that they could count on three things from me. One, that I would communicate with them regularly. So it was really important to let them know that I was going to not sort of just leave them out there wondering what was going on. Secondly, that I was going to try to make each decision with their best interests in mind as I was thinking about how my life was changing and all the challenges that I was facing, I was realizing that, of course, the students were also having those challenges. So for example, with assignment deadlines and things, things were gonna get pushed back instead of getting you know, pushed sooner, for example. And there was a lot of relief from the students with that announcement. I think for some reason, some people felt like it was gonna get harder or, I mean, in many ways it did get harder, but that, I was going to make the constraints harder on them than what would have happened in class. And the third thing I promised them was that I was going to approach them and interact with them with an air of flexibility and grace. That because I had no idea what was happening and I was having in the middle of the semester to change where we were going, um, that I was going to be flexible with them. And the one thing that I asked of them was that they returned that to me, that they just not, not in huge ways, but just to acknowledge that as I was making all these changes, as they were adapting to everything, I was probably going to screw some things up. And I did. And it worked out. Like learning still occurred and the semester ended. And I mean, I think we all made it out mostly okay. Um, and so again, I was grateful to have that opportunity to be very authentic with them and for them to be authentic with me in terms of their questions and concerns. And that really helped me as I then began to make specific plans about what we were gonna do with the class. So as I transitioned the class online, um, I had taught this class in an entirely online format in the past. So in some ways I had that advantage, but I also was really struggling with uh, what I thought was the great community that we built in our face-to-face -face class. And so I didn't want to lose that you know, sort of aspect, and I didn't want to just turn it into how I had done the class online in the past. Um, so the first thing that I did was I had students complete a, a brief survey to kind of get a read of where people were. Um, I had students tell me if they, you, what their concerns were specifically about my class after they'd had a couple weeks to think about it. I asked them about the availability of their textbook. Most of them did not have the textbook. They'd either, you know, some of them had already left for spring break and their textbooks were in Lubbock, or um, we had just transitioned to another, to the second textbook in the class. And I think honestly, some of the students hadn't yet purchased it, so they didn't have the book. Um, so that was helpful for me thinking about, you know, how to move that forward. And then the third thing I asked them was, 
if there was anything that they wanted me to know about their circumstances. And it was an optional question because I realized that not everybody wants to or needs to share in that way. But I was really bowled over by the responses that I got from students to that question. And I would say that out of my 75 students, probably 70 of them answered it. And again, it was an opportunity for me to authentically invite them to share information. And then they were very authentic in their responses to me. And I learned a lot. I learned things like the problems with limited internet connectivity, either because of their service or because there were so many people now in their household who were using it, that they were getting constantly kicked off. I learned about how many of my students were teaching younger siblings or nieces or nephews and were trying to struggle, like, how do I do classwork and take care of the younger people and, you know, balance all of that. I learned of several students who either they themselves or family members or parents were losing jobs and there was great economic stress and concern. And I also learned that a lot of them in that first week when we came back to classes, they were lonely. A lot of people just point blank told me that, that they'd lost their support system, that they'd gone from being with their people, you know, here in Lubbock to being other places or, you know, not getting to get together with their friends in the same ways or to be with their family members. And so I responded individually to each of those students' comments. And I think that that was an important way to sort of start off that transition to online. I couldn't solve their problems. I mean, I couldn't instantly make them have internet or I couldn't instantly solve the economic problems that their families were facing. But I think just letting them know that I had heard them, that I was listening and that it was important to me, I think was really important in terms of our dynamic as we moved forward. So one of the things that I did as a result of that was I continued to give the students the opportunity to check in about every two or three weeks. Again, it was always optional. And again, most people did it throughout the semester. And I was glad to sort of get the updates. There were some very positive updates about things that were happening with people as they were adjusting. And so that was helpful to get that, you know, to continue that relationship with the students. Another thing I did as a result of some of the comments on that survey is that I created a discussion board opportunity for students to encourage each other, which is something I know a lot of people did as well in the spring. And I was really inspired by this because the students did a great job of reaching out and encouraging one another. They would, you know, post pictures of pets. They would post inspiring quotes or just encouraging messages or pictures of places that inspire them. And I think that it was really neat for me to see how my students were communicating with one another and continuing to have that sense of community that I think we'd established in the first half of the semester that I think carried over in some unique ways, you know, after that. And probably one of the other main things that I did that that really was specific to the pandemic in terms of my the changes that I did with the course content was that we had transitioned to talking about family theories and most of my students were back with their families or were with other family members at this point. And so each of the assignments that they had with all the family theories, they had the opportunity to relate the theoretical information to what they were experiencing in the pandemic. And they also had the opportunity to not do that. They always have two choices. But again, most people took that opportunity and I learned some amazing things through that. One thing I learned is that although I thought my previous assignments were pretty solid, they apparently were not. Because what I found in the spring was that students' responses were so detailed and so in-depth that I really felt that they had learned the material in some ways at a deeper level. I think because they were able to so immediately relate it to what was happening to them right then. One brief example of that is that one of the theories we talk about is conflict theory, which revolves around the idea that conflict is caused by scarcity of resources. And so I gave them the opportunity to think about a resource that was scarce and how that conflict may be negotiated 
and if anything positive might come from that. And of course, the most common scarce resource was toilet paper, which is probably no surprise. Um, but one of the things I loved about this question or their responses to this assignment was um, the last question asks them, you know, either has anything positive come from the scarcity or do you anticipate that anything positive could come from the scarcity? And I would say that the majority of the students were very hopeful and very positive about what might happen post pandemic or as the pandemic continued. You know, they talked about um, people sharing what they had with one another, people caring for each other in deeper ways, um, people reaching out and checking on people in ways that they hadn't done before. And I really was very inspired, particularly on some days where I was not feeling particularly positive or hopeful to think that, you know, here were the students who were, um, you know, willing to share their own experience, again, to be very authentic with me and uh, that they had a positive outlook in terms of what was happening. Um, and I had a lot of students tell me at the end of the semester that they felt like they learned this information really completely, again, because they had that opportunity to tie it to something that was happening right then and there. Um, again, I, as I said, I used to think my assignments were pretty good and allowed people to make connections, but I think the sort of timeliness of it uh, was a unique uh, opportunity to really seize on that to help them to learn. Something else I learned about myself in the spring that well actually I already knew this but I really do not enjoy making videos of myself. Do not. Do not enjoy it. Don't enjoy it if somebody else videos me. Don't enjoy it if I do it. Just do not enjoy it. Um, but I did want to do it from the standpoint of sometimes it was just easier to explain an assignment or a concept in a video rather than trying to type out a long explanation. And so um, the first video that I made was probably about one and a half to two minutes long. And I probably did it like 10 to 12 times, not even kidding, because they were all bad. I thought like, oh, like I messed that up or I said that or I did that or what was that hand gesture? Like, what are you even doing with your face in that one? So I was super hypercritical of myself and um, I don't know why I had this misperception that if I was videoing that it had to be perfect. Like, I don't know where that came from. And finally, I just calmed down, which was good, and realized that um, I'm actually not perfect in class. <laughs> like the students get to see all those tidbits live when I like go off on a tangent or talk to myself in the middle of what I'm saying. And um, so I was very nervous when I finally posted one of those very imperfect videos, um, but the students loved it. Like they, they just, they commented on it and not in a mean way. Like they actually were very nice and like thanked me for doing that and you know, things like that. And so it, again, it was an opportunity and a reminder to me that authentic, even if a bit messy is very much okay. Like those videos were messy but that's the reality of life. And again, it was an opportunity to have that point of connection with students to, you know, like I said, to get distracted in my video or go off on a little bit of a tangent and it didn't matter. As an, and as a matter of fact, I think it helped them um, a little bit. The, um, so my, my students finished strong. I mean, we made it to the end of the semester and everybody finished and did really quite well, I thought, um, throughout the end of the course. And so one of the things that I've carried over into the fall, although it's quite different, I'm teaching a graduate class right now and we're meeting via Zoom is, um, I'm still providing opportunities to check in. You know, they have some different needs. Graduate students have some different needs and concerns. We're at a different time and place. Um, but allowing them that, I'm still allowing the encouragement uh, aspect on the discussion board. And um, they also are being very creative in how they're talking to one another um, about that. And certainly as that class is meeting on Zoom, there's been all kinds of messy things that happen, um, including a day that I was hysterical with laughter because the lawn care people were spending an inordinate amount of time outside my window. And that's all I could focus on. Like I couldn't turn that off that there were these people like right outside my window and making all this noise. 
Um, so we just went with it, but I did, I really couldn't get a hold of myself in class. Like I just got so tickled and, you know, part of my brain was like, stop Melinda, just stop. Like you're teaching. And then I was like, Melinda, like they got stuff going on where they are too. You know, like this is just what's happening. And we, we pulled it together. Um, I am doing the zoom synchronously with my class this semester. Um, so they got to experience that hysterical outburst live. Um, so I think that, you know, as I've thought about this transition and I've thought about the things that have been difficult, it's also been really good to just ground myself back into this idea of, um, you know, being authentic in terms of what I'm doing and me being authentic for me also requires me to acknowledge the personhood of my students. And that's really what I tried to focus on throughout the spring and continue to focus on that. Yes, they are students in my class, but first and foremost, they are people who have their own situations happening and their own reactions and their own stressors and their own worries and concerns. And I want them to know that I acknowledge that they're a person first and then they're a student. And so um, I really want to kind of meet them in that in that authentic space. So those are some of the things that I have uh, that I have learned and some ways that I have adapted throughout this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. Really appreciate that. And I love that focus on authenticity and that regrounding. We'll transition now to Justin. Dr. Hart, you're up. There. <laughs> thank you, uh, Suzanne. And I want to thank Suzanne and Patrick Hughes and Bob McDonald for the invitation to speak. Um, it's great to be here. Um, and so I um, want to start my presentation by confessing that I'm one of those people that uh, was extremely resistant to teaching online uh, up to March. Um, I had never taught online before. I was a late adopter of Blackboard, although I had done some stuff with Blackboard, so I didn't have to learn Blackboard as a few of my colleagues did. Um, but uh, it was a daunting challenge. I sort of uh, felt that moment of, okay, I guess we're really going to do this. Um, I had resisted doing it uh, throughout my teaching career. And, uh, and so I have learned some things about online teaching and actually um, volunteered to teach an online course uh, this summer uh, for the first time. And so uh, the, the experience, I think, has uh, definitely uh, opened up possibilities for my teaching uh, that I hadn't uh, contemplated, wasn't willing to contemplate up to this point. Um, the pandemic hit and I, like Dr. Colwell, um, I got the mess. I, I actually, reading the tea leaves, I remember the NBA being canceled and the NCAA playoffs, uh, the NCAA season being canceled. And so I was pretty sure the university was going online and uh, other universities had already gone online. And so I, I had done some thinking on Wednesday night. I was teaching Tuesday, Thursday. I'd done some thinking on Wednesday night about what I would say to my students and then got the email from uh, President Skuvenek in the morning and then walked into my two classes. And um, I remember uh, that I told them certain things about how the class was going to be, which I quickly realized uh, when we had that sort of two-week uh, break to contemplate what we were doing that uh, none of those things were going to actually hold up. Um, and so as I stepped back from what I had told them uh, would, would be happening, I had to sort of contemplate two things which were separate but related. One, how to adapt all my curriculum to an online format, which I'd never done before. And two, how to approach these students in such a time of upheaval. Um, what kind of professor, what kind of pandemic professor I wanted to be, I guess, um, is, is how I would put that. And typically, um, 
I would have these conversations in the hall with my colleagues. Um, we have a vibrant teaching culture in the history department. And so I'm used to sharing uh, reactions with my colleagues on these kinds of questions. Uh, that wasn't possible. The university was shut down. There was no uh, hallway conversation. I'm connected to most of my colleagues on uh, Facebook. And so some of those conversations occurred over Facebook. But much more than that, um, I got a lot of ideas from the array of both colleagues and I'm connected to on Twitter. Um, I turned to Twitter for a lot of ideas. I did come to a TLPDC session um, that helped too. Uh, but I would say um, having sort of my feed on Twitter uh, was the biggest influence on my teaching and, and ways to think about doing things I hadn't done before. I've always tried to be student friendly, um, but I would say that my Twitter feed is even more so almost to a fault um, caters towards being generous towards students. And so reading other people um, being really um, quite insistent that we needed to put our sh ourselves in our uh, students uh, shoes uh, pushed me to think about what I was going to do, what kind of online pandemic professor I wanted to be. I was teaching two classes and one class was a research seminar that had just entered the research phase. And so that kind of took care of itself. Um, I did two things for that. I, one was that I wanted to make sure that I stayed in touch with my students and tried not to let them get behind. And so I gave extensive written feedback on every little pre-assignment they turned in towards the research paper and I just made myself very available for Zoom meetings and so uh, that that one it was just about um, letting them know that I was there for them and all but uh, yeah th there were three students who I never heard from again um, after March, uh, I sent them emails and they didn't write back. Uh, but other than that, everyone finished the class and got credit for it. Um, and so I, I was proud of that. So I was quite nervous um, about how that would work. My other class, though, which was the much bigger challenge, was a first year US history survey with 220 students um, and on, in an auditorium. And that class is traditionally structured around three high stakes exams, as well as some blackboard reading responses. And the exams are heavily dependent on lecture materials. And so I had to figure out what I was going to do to adapt that course to an online environment. One thing I decided quickly was that I didn't want to do online high stakes exams. Um, I, I understand that in some disciplines, probably there's no way around that. Um, but Twitter convinced me that Proctorio and similar um, programs are kind of a, a privacy nightmare. Um, and more importantly, pedagogically speaking, um, the point of a history course is not to memorize specific content but to learn how to think and so i'm not training engineers who are going to build a faulty bridge if they miss some information and so if they missed something in my class okay um, i was more concerned with continuing to help them become better thinkers that was really my goal um, and the other thing I decided was that what were they paying me for? What was what were they supposed to get out of my class that they wouldn't get out of someone else's class or at another university? And so I decided that I would record my lectures um, and uh, what I would do in that way was to uh, I use PowerPoint pretty extensively as a digital slide projector in my uh, survey courses, in all my courses really. And so um, I recorded my PowerPoints with my lecturer as a voiceover. And I used QuickTime, uh, I'm a Mac user, and that was super easy, but uh, I know there are a lot of other ways to do it. I read that PowerPoint, the sound is not very good if you use the recording function in PowerPoint. Uh, others may have had different experiences with that, um, but uh, QuickTime worked really well. I got a, a good um, microphone and, and did that. Um, 
And what I had to decide was, okay, how am I going to hold them accountable for this information without a high stakes exam? And so I gave them a response sheet for each lecture where they had to identify and explain back to me the main ideas of the lecture to confirm that they had heard what I said. Um, that's what I was concerned with is that they actually heard what I said. Um, and I was reasonably pleased with that, although as I'll talk about in just a minute, uh, I adapted it uh, somewhat for what I did this fall. Um, I, I changed the assignment somewhat. I immediately, uh, in addition to deciding I would focus on the lectures, I canceled all the remaining reading. Um, and I had really mixed feelings about this. Reading is an important part of the history class, but I was one thing I got from Twitter was that I didn't want to create extra work for them. Um, I was horrified by stories on Twitter and also some from my students, frankly, about professors at, at this university who decided to add work to make up for lost time in class. And I, I was really determined that that wasn't going to be um, how I would handle that. Um, and so I um, most importantly wanted to do a new assignment that I read about on Twitter. And so I had to think, okay, if I'm gonna do this new assignment, I have to cancel something that is already in my class. I'm not going to add an assignment and give them more work. And so the new assignment for the remainder of their grade in replacement of the readings, I had students keep a weekly diary um, on what it was like to live through the age of COVID. Um, I told them they had to write 500 words about their reaction to living in this time, that there were no wrong experiences as long as it was their experiences and their words. And for the most part, I got that. I did get one plagiarized um, COVID diary. <laughs> Somebody turned in the same COVID diary as another one of my students. Um, and so I don't know who actually had the experiences, but anyway, um, that was sort of amusing. Uh, but the final uh, COVID diary, uh, I had them can uh, do something slightly different where they had to analyze their own previous diary entries and treat them as a primary source. Historians talk about primary sources as documents of the time. Um, and so they had to sort of imagine what future historians would say about America in the spring of 2020 based on their own diary entries as a primary source. One thing that I really liked about this assignment was that it allowed me to keep an eye on them. Um, I, I had mostly my, I checked in on these assignments, but I didn't read all 200 of them. Um, but I had my TAs grading them. And a TA told me of one student who didn't turn in their lecture assignment for that week, but did do the diary. And what she wrote in her diary was that she was really struggling. Her parents had lost their jobs. She had an aunt with COVID who was in the hospital. She was working overtime because she was the only one in the family um, who was pulling in income. And so I was able to email her and offer her extensions on the assignments and she wound up with an A minus in the class. So I was really happy um, with that, how that situation turned out. She was very grateful. Um, and, uh, and so that was, that was something that came out of that. A lot of our students, um, their experiences were uh, much more ones of boredom and anxiety and depression, um, you know, just sort of sitting around the house. Um, but there was a whole, a whole um, variety of experiences, and I can talk more about that in the Q&A, some of the things uh, that I got out of those diaries, um, if, if anyone wants to hear more about that. I'm looking into a way to maybe archive those with the Southwest Collection. Um, and so sort of creating a permanent resource uh, on campus. Um, and so uh, I hope that works out. It frankly led to a lot of inflated grades in my class. Any sincere effort at a diary was 100. Um, but I decided that if ever there was a semester to be an easy A, um, this was the semester. And so I just, um, that was just the decision I made. Um, this fall presented new challenges. I had a, I have a grad class, which is largely unaffected. It's being done by Zoom. Um, and, and so it's just a discussion-based class. Uh, students read a book and an article a week, and then we talk. Um, 
but uh, the other class I am teaching is an undergrad junior level lecture and discussion class. And traditionally, the way that's set up is that I have lectures on Monday and Wednesday and discussion on Friday. And so the assessments for those classes are a combination of take home papers and in class exams over the lecture material. And so over the summer, I got the university's mandates um, regarding COVID accommodations for our students. And so what I decided pretty quickly was that I needed a way to, to make sure that any sick students wouldn't fall too far behind. And also for my safety and all of our safety, um, to make sure that there was no incentive for six students to come to class. Um, that was one thing I was really concerned about. Um, and so I decided to teach the class as a hybrid with uh, lectures online and discussions face to face. And so as in the spring, I recorded my PowerPoints with a lecture voiceover. Um, this time I designed a different assignment for accountability and I like this one a little bit better. I always put up an, a very basic outline with terms and uh, people and places and that sort of thing. Um, and so I, uh, in the PowerPoint, and so I give them that outline and they have to annotate it for me. They have to fill in the details. And so this even more so than the assignment in the spring ensures that they actually watch my lecture all the way through. Um, I had a lot of students who would sort of listen at the beginning and the end to get the main points and a couple examples, which is what they had to do for the spring assignment. Here, I can tell um, if they have actually listened to the lecture all the way through. Um, and so I canceled exams again. I just, I decided I wasn't gonna do um, the, the traditional exam that I had done. Um, I'm holding them responsible for lecture material by having them turn in an annotated outline. For discussion, students have two options. They can either come to class and earn points by participating the traditional way, or they can answer four short essay questions on the readings on Blackboard. And so that sets up an option for them where if they are sick, um, they don't have any incentive to come to class because they aren't losing points for the class. Um, they are still able to get full credit for the discussion, even if they are not present in the face-to-face -face discussion. And so my goal was to preserve the dynamism of in-class discussion, which I think is, you can approximate it on Zoom, but it's impossible to fully replicate a classroom on Zoom um, while making sure that no student would lose points for being sick. Um, and this gives the added benefit of giving a written option for students who don't like to talk. Um, and traditionally, I think it, one value of history classes is that you do learn to talk, um, but uh, that's, that's something if they don't want to be a participant in class discussion, they can write out to show that they did the readings. And my other goal was to set up an easy transition to fully online if necessary. And I guess we'll see if that is needed. Basically, everything in my class would be the same except the face-to-face -face discussions would move to Zoom as the class goes on before. Um, however, I'll close on this. In the category of sort of tinkering is never done and you're always trying to revise um, what what you're uh, what you're trying to do the class started with about two-thirds of them coming to face-to-face -face discussions and one-third doing the blackboard assignment now here we are three four weeks into the semester i'm only getting about a third of the students in face-to-face -face discussion and two-thirds are moving online and so we're about to the point where it's almost i've lost critical mass to conduct an in-person face-to-face discussion and so I have to figure out like um, very soon what to do, what are students or why are students doing the online assignment instead. Um, and so I'm going to craft a survey where uh, to see if students would do, be more likely to do an in-person discussion if it was on Zoom instead of in a classroom. I'm not sure if they're concerned about coming to the classroom um, or if I, maybe I've made the online assignment too easy. I don't think that's it, um, but I'm not 
clear on why they're not coming to the classroom. Um, but I have one student who can't do Zoom because the face to, he has a face-to-face -face class immediately prior. Um, and so I guess uh, the lesson I take away from this is that our conditions are maybe just a more acute uh, situation of what teachers always face, which is this continual adjustment throughout the semester is just even more than normal in these times where we're constantly um, have to be on our toes. And I see somebody saying many might be sick. Yes, uh, that has occurred to me too. But I'll stop there. Thank you, Justin. I, I really appreciate that focus on continual adjustment and the way that you talked about revising your assignments and being sensitive and, and thinking of this constant tweaking. So thank you for sharing that. We'll pass now to Dr. Chris Smith. Chris. Hey there, let me just uh, do my own screen share here. Uh, friends, I'm just gonna share my whole uh, desktop because I'm going to be moving back and forth between a couple of different sources. I hope that's okay with everybody. Um, yeah, I hope that's okay with everybody. So. Uh, I want to begin actually by just touching base on with some notes that I made while my colleagues were speaking. I want to thank everybody for putting this together. Um, I'm delighted to say that a lot of what I'm going to be referencing, I think, has been touched upon by Melinda and Justin. So I find that encouraging, at least in terms of my own uh, evolving practice. Um, a, a small point to be made, just so that I don't forget to make it, the Justin used the great locution, the dynamism of in-class discussion. Um, I found that using breakout rooms for peer review with two or three students doing peer review in a breakout room and then knowing they have to come back and present to the full group, even within a 50 minute class, gets a good, it's not exactly discussion, but there is a good sense of multivalent dialogue. Um, I love Justin's comment about a vibrant teaching culture and history. Like him, I have found academic Twitter immensely helpful and actually quite rigorous. And at times it was kind of kicking my butt to be more thoughtful, more self-reflective than I than would have occurred to me. So there was a learning uh, for me too. Like Justin, I was teaching, uh, like Melinda, I was teaching a seminar, but like Justin, I was also teaching a large enrollment course. And so that had, the pivot there had all kinds of um, issues. Uh, I'll pull up my PowerPoint in just a second. I just want to touch on these uh, because they're things that emerge directly from my colleagues' presentations. I actually already employ a number of online tools and resources because I'm teaching music history, but also because I would be, try to be someone who is aware of the cost and the logistical complexity of more traditional methods, cost of textbooks, cost of purchasing CDs back when we did that. So I use YouTube and Spotify extensively, the other free tools. I use a digital table of contents in Blackboard so that students don't actually have to find things on JSTOR, although that's a good skill to have, but they link directly to that table of contents through, through the Blackboard site. I always send a follow-up email. And these, these are things I've done for years that translated helpfully in uh, quarantine. I've always send a further to email after every class session to Blackboard saying, here are my thoughts, here are the next due deadlines, here are the next links, et cetera, et cetera. It's not a review, it's housekeeping, but it's housekeeping that's a follow-up. And I mandate that they have to respond to those, that they have to acknowledge those things. Um, like Justin, and I think Melinda said this as well, I, I, I wished to proceed synchronously, but recognized that it might not, synchronous presentation might not be possible for students or even preferable. And so I have been making Zoom cloud videos available as review methods. In the School of Music, we've used, um, we, we use just crazy amounts of Zoom storage space. And so the fact that our Zoom archive, cloud archive goes away after a week is actually good because it gives a student a week to do that review and then uh, they know that they can move on. Uh, so I, with that said, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and fire my PowerPoint. Um, I also was aware of Sarah, the, the mighty Sarah Brinker's use of uh, PowerPoint as a virtual background, but I'm not going to do that. And that's because I'm moving back, back and forth between these various sources. So just going to talk a little bit about the course of events uh, as they occurred for me. And please, uh, if, if you can't, I've got your avatars minimized. So if you cannot see something on the screen, please someone tell me that. Um, up until March 11th, which I'm kind of, call, kind of calling a pre-pivot period, 
um, I did a bunch of reflecting and information gathering because like Justin, I inferred it was possible that we were gonna be asked to pivot. So here's a first thing that I, first strategy that I did. This is an excerpt from a March 9th email, which I sent to my colleagues. Uh, I'll just read it, forgive me for reading off my PowerPoint. I know that's not best practices. Um, PowerPoint slide with a portrait of Dr. Mitchell, the Chancellor of the System, in light of fears, I thought I might share this with my various classes and say to them, quote, classes, this is the Chancellor of the TTU System, the medical doctor, et cetera, et cetera. I thought, I, I felt that that was important, at least in order to be able to convey to the students in, the, in a, a moment of great uncertainty, there are expert people who are making decisions. And at, as of March 9th, I had a reasonable conviction that those decisions were going to be well informed. I, events continued to evolve. Um, by March 11th, also by March 11th, I had um, decided that it was important for me, like Justin and Melinda both, uh, for me to get some quality concrete data from students, uh, not to infer or presume what their concerns or resources or restrictions might be, to actually find out. So I found a, a academic Twitter, led me to a version of this form I'm gonna share in a moment from this professor, I think she's a sociology professor actually at NYU. So I'm sharing that form just now. And this is what my students saw. I won't take you all the way through it. I've become way better with the Google Suite, way better with the Google Suite, friends. So technology, access, devices, etc. Synchronous versus asynchronous. Accessibility issues, ADA and related basic needs issues, because I realized that maybe no one was asking them that. Additional concerns, um, I'll, I'll, I'll nudge up against FERPA here by showing you briefly the statistical results. Blue represents an affirmative response. In some ways, I found this sort of encouraging because it told me what they did or didn't have the capacity to execute. I began very early by saying to them, everything you need to do for this class can be done over a cell signal and with a smartphone. E.g., you don't have to have Wi-Fi, you don't have to have a tablet or laptop. Although we all know that the Blackboard interface is approximately crap via their smartphone app. What kind of devices? This was incredibly encouraging, right, friends? Because I could realize, okay, 80% of them have a computer. 71% have a smartphone. There are a few who have very, very little access. So I, could, I, I would not ignore those few, but at least I, I understood if I need to make individual accommodations, the numbers I was dealing with. I was surprised that most preferred normal class time, most requested sync, and, and this is an interesting breakdown, live, versus pre-recorded versus uh, asynchronous. An almost equivalent breakdown, which is why I made them available via Zoom in the aftermath. Accessibility, not many who had accessibility issues, but the ones who did really did, which is exactly what um, our ADA consultants would tell us. Some didn't have, most did have the basic needs access they needed, but the ones who didn't have it really had an issue. Yep, additional concerns, questions, et cetera, right? So uh, not to, uh, I won't overshare that as it were. I'll get back to my PowerPoint. So that's sort of at the moment of the pivot, if I can, if I can put it that way, at the moment of the pivot. This is what I wrote to the students the day after. Uh, it's my recollection that uh, in fact, we were going to be having an extended spring break. This is the opening of quite extensive and detailed email. I've got a link to it here in, to, uh, on a Google Drive. And in the aftermath, I'd be happy to share that with my colleagues if they would find it useful. It was speaking to everything that I could think of and also things that had been revealed in the form. After the pivot, we had a, an extended uh, spring break. I 
was appreciative of that, both in terms of prepping for online teaching, but also because it allowed for a two week quarantine. Right. That I, I got that. I understood that. I understood that to be an example of smart decision making. This is me to my TAs when we were back on duty on the 23rd, but a week in advance of the students reporting. Right. Trying to make sure that my my co instructors had an understanding of what we were doing and, and of thought happening. And then we spent <laughs> a number of us spent a whole lot of the summer thinking about what was coming right what we we're going to have to deal with. And so I'm going to again, I'm going to just uh, cite two small examples. The first was something I am by no means a zoom ninja like the Justin. It was not something that I wanted to do, but I did decide, well, if we're going to have to do this, then probably not only I, but some admired colleagues are going to have to get better with zoom. So I started experimenting with zoom and then I started running zoom salons and I would say, look, let's all go pretend to be students together in a zoom room. Yeah, that was essentially what I did. <laughs> I wasn't very happy that day, as you can see. Yeah. In addition, I, uh, I developed some other stuff. I tried to compile some resources. These are things that I think a lot of us were actually looking at, right? We were, we were searching around on the web and trying to find things that what can help us, what can help us, how can we work? And I thought I'll put that on a playlist because then I can share it and others might find it equally useful. Okay. This kind of takes us to the current semester, or takes me to the current semester, and some of the things that I've been trying to do with the last six months of pedagogical um, evolution. So let me just talk about fall 2020 semester. I've continued to try to evolve best practices. I continue to try to use the online tools, expand my use of the online tools, especially open, open source texts, really important, either because of financial restrictions or because of library restrictions, open source texts are important. A lot of my students didn't know that there were local libraries that would, that would have some of the materials they needed. I added one additional channel, which is a, a discussion tool called Slack which does, you know, I read something, Justin, on academic Twitter that said, yes, Blackboard LMS is where discussion threads go to die. <laughs> and so I decided I would use Slack because one of my conferences used them. I'm like, wow, this is great, threaded discussions. It's free, they can get an app for it, wonderful. Here are some things that I discovered in learning from my students, as Melinda said very eloquently, Justin, as well, things that my students' experience taught me which I learned because I was paying attention rather than just sort of running on a lot of years of riffing. One of, one of the things that I discovered, <coughs> excuse me, was most challenging and continue to find most challenging about teaching in the Zoom space is reading the room. I would be one of those, but I like to pace around the room, but I also body language, stance, facial expressions, an awful lot of, I, I became, I became excruciating aware of how much information students give me as a teacher in the classroom, which is nonverbal, and which I believe quite appropriately should impact how I'm doing what I'm doing. So it's way harder to read the room. It's one of the reasons why I like to really maximize the screen. It's also one reason why I set up like this, right? Yeah, so that I'm not, so that I'm there. It's, I'm trying to be there, as Melinda said so eloquently. I found chat initially incredibly distracting, but it reminded me, and it's reminding me again in this very session, right this very moment, chatters, that there can be an entire CNN style crawl of additional engagement happening. Plus it's documented, plus it's transcribed and it's invaluable. So I developed this locution where I would regularly ask a question and say, if you don't want to speak, drop it in the chat, drop it in the chat, drop it in the chat, because I could always go back to that. On the days when I felt like I needed to take attendance, I'd say, oh, let's do attendance. Drop your name in the chat right now. Yep. Not because I, I have no interest in, in, in proctoring, none. But if there's huge disengagement going on, it's helpful me if I, if I know when it's occurring. And the chat helps. I mentioned breakout rooms. Um, I have made my Zoom rooms available to my own circle of advisees when I wasn't present. Like it was a, 
like a kind of uh, colloquium. Say, hey, you want to have the, the Zoom room for an hour for a colloquium? It's, of course, we all have recognized, although I don't think it's just been, it's uh, recently been said that it makes guest lecturers not only very welcome, but far more feasible. Because I can say to a colleague, look, man, I'll buy you a six pack. Will you come and give us 40 minutes? I'll send you a six pack, right? Likewise, people have said to me, look, man, give me 40 minutes. I'll send you a six pack and I will do that. This is, I, I, there are no silver linings to a pandemic, but these are things I'm trying to learn, right? I'm trying to embrace the, the necessary infrastructure change, to embrace the possibility of virtual conferencing, particularly for junior faculty and graduate students who have limited funds. That's hugely valuable. Lots and lots of additional manifestations and channels for student agency, as both Melinda and Justin already said. Looking ahead and prepping for the long haul, I'm trying to prep practically and also philosophically, right? What do I need to do for my spring courses? What do I need to do uh, in my head to try to continue to move, continue to, to not just adapt, but to enrich? Some takeaways. Here are the things that I, I have been brought home to me. This is just a bullet point list I made for myself that have been brought home to me by this experience. Teaching, for me, to me, teaching is about modeling. It's about modeling critical thinking. It's about modeling a sense of community responsibility, responsibility for one's fellow citizens. It's about modeling professional ethics and transparency. It's about modeling, as Melinda said very eloquently, one's own personal convictions, living one's convictions in an authentic way, as Melinda said. It's about this pandemic reveals to us about how inst institutional structures work, how they fail, and how very vulnerable they are. And therefore, that COVID op is, is an opportunity, and in fact, it's a mandate, I would argue, to re-examine all those things. And in light of that, I'll give you my final pair of slides. This is something that I did uh, as part of the recent Scholar Sunday Teach Two-Day Teaching uh, action it was undertaken by university professors across the web, but mostly history people, but by no means exclusively, um, something that like Justin and I became aware of through Twitter. I chose to present a project on the Black Panther Party because one of my courses is a course on music of the African diaspora. So I chose to approach this as an historical phenomenon. And as a practicum in preparing new history teaching, I said to my students, this is what I would do if I had 48 hours to prepare a lecture on the Black Panther Party, which is not an area of my specialization. And then I modeled that. And I actually have a, a link to the Google Doc there, and I'll close with that. This is what I did. And in fact, this is, these are the notes that I derived from the subtitling of provided by Zoom to present it as both a historical study, but also as a way of thinking about being a scholar in a time when social issues are shaking the absolute foundations, not only of our academic institution, but shaking the foundations of our culture. So that's what I got. Thank you, Chris. Um, boy, you just did exactly what you said and modeled so much of what you valued in your talk. One thing that I want to ask you to do, Chris, I'm going to put you on the spot for just a moment. I have a feeling that people are wondering how you live captioned your talk just then. Um, would you show us how you used PowerPoint to live caption? I will try to. <laughs> okay. I just have a I, feeling that people are going to ask about that. Yeah, that. That's probably all over the chat, right? Okay. Uh, let's look at settings. I'm, I'm, yes. Okay, friends. I think I'm right here. So maybe share I'm your right screen. Here. Yes, I'm sorry. I... I looking at my screen and not sharing that, that's not helping you much, is it? Okay. So here's my PowerPoint. Under slideshow, if I'm not mistaken, you can check or uncheck always use subtitles. Now, if I'm right, and we'll try it in just a second, if I'm correct, 
that is something I adjusted so long ago that I forgot how I did it. So let me try maximizing and checking whether this is providing our subtitles. Okay, now let me, this is exactly how I would do this, how my students would do it too. I'll uncheck always use subtitles and assess whether it is now no longer working. All right, friends, thank you for catching me on that, Suzanne. Friends, it's in PowerPoint, under slideshow, upper right-hand corner, always use subtitles. You know what else I discovered? Here's a mind-boggling thing. It will permit you to select the subtitling language. And I checked it. And you know how I checked it? Because I am not a French speaker. And my mind went. That's such a great tip and tool. So um, I'm, I'm just going to say mission accomplished. We all just walked away with something. That's a great takeaway, right? It's, it, if, I, if I never again have to be apologetic to ADA for failing to subtitle, that's not a silver lining, but I just had a teachable moment. I, I, I love it. So let's see, I saw a few things in the chat that I want to um, bring attention to. I wonder if Justin, Chris, any of our participants, Melinda, if there are people that you follow on Twitter that you've really um, learned from, would you drop that in the chat right now? That would be helpful. I think we know that there are hashtags. Jody Rogenson recommended academic Twitter. Um, but let's, let's just drop some of those in the chat so that we all have some good ideas about who we might follow. Um, and Chris, I'm so glad to see you mention Kevin. He is a friend of mine and he is a great guy. Yeah. Amazing, amazing leader. He is, he is. So um, while we're doing that, um, we are, look at those, these are great. We're, we're starting to see some show up there. One thing, other thing that Carol brought up um, in two different prompts, she mentioned the idea of um, boredom or separation that we saw in the spring and wondered if you're still seeing that with your students now um, or a reduced energy maybe to participate as students. So I wondered if uh, someone would like to comment on that, Chris, Melinda, Justin. I mean, Justin, I, can you uh, yeah. unmute, buddy? Yeah, uh, I was typing. Could you repeat that? <laughs> so Carol mentioned um, in two different chats, um, prompts, that she was curious if we saw the same boredom or separation, maybe reduced energy that we saw in, in March when we had our pivot, if we still see that now that we've seen everything continue and we still have changes. Well, I wonder if that is um, one of the reasons. I saw somebody say uh, in response to my suggestion that uh, I'm seeing dwindling numbers willing to come to face to face, that they're not wanting to get out of bed for one class, that, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, and so it may not be a fear of the classroom um, as much as it is uh, just uh, this, this whole thing has them. Um, kind of uh, stuck uh, spinning their wheels a little bit. And in my case, with giving them an option for not coming, um, it, you know, kind of I've reinforced that unintentionally. Um, so, yeah. Chris? Yeah, just extending Justin's comment. Uh, I'm teaching... Uh, only uh, online because the condition of my building is such. My building is is engineered for 375 and in an ordinary semester houses 600. And so anything academic that could pivot to online entirely helped my colleagues who actually needed physical spaces, right? Took pressure off the building. So it's been a pretty in comprehensive pivot, if I could say that, to online. When I surveyed them in March, and when I check in with them now in the fall semester, what I hear heard then statistically and hear now anecdotally is that they value being in a space, whether it's a physical space or a virtual space, 
together. So my inference, and I think it's justifiable, is that the ones who preferred to avoid, who voted against asynchronous, they are voting in favor of the being togetherness of a synchronous meeting. Linda, would you like to add to that? Sure. Yeah, I think um, one of the things I've seen with the graduate students is, I mean, they're they're they are very participatory in the synchronous Zoom session. But one of the things I've heard in various comments throughout office hours and things like that is that um, I think that they're, I mean, as one of them said to me a couple weeks ago, I feel like I have all this time because I'm not on campus, but I don't know how to get everything done. You know, I think it's, which is a problem I share. I mean, I get it, right? I mean, it's, it's slightly different, but it's the same thing. It seems like if you're mainly at home that you don't have, you know, you're not traveling to campus or you're not having as many face-to-face -face meetings or things. And so we've talked in class about how to try to figure that out, like to create structure for yourself in ways that make sense for you and your, you know, your schedule in order to do it. So I do think that they're still feeling kind of, uh, that some of them are feeling still kind of disconnected and um, kind of having some of those struggles still for sure. Yeah, I, I love that we're um, also talking about self-care, right, and, and motivation and, and um, kind of melding our questions together as we see in the chat and seeing some suggestions even in the chat for um, self-care and, and making lists and, and finding structure that perhaps then keeps us going. Um, I love Levi's question here, and, and Chris has jumped in. Levi asked, what's one gadget, software, app, whatever it is, that you've picked up in the last few months that you can't live without? So, Melinda, Justin, you want to jump in? Well, this will be an indication of where I was coming from. Zoom um, is, is, you know, sort of that's... And I think a lot of people are sort of in that position as they're like you're going from zero to sort of a minimum acceptable. Um, I have a blue mic. Um, I see Chris is saying a good LED light. I haven't invested in that, but I've read, read that as well. Um, so yeah, the, the blue mic, I think, um, made my recorded lectures uh, sound a lot better. I've got something I, I will add. It's not it's not gear specifically. I have started. I I don't know. It's so hard to read the room on Zoom, right? <clears throat> it's like an aphorism. Hard to read the room on Zoom, but I actually explicitly say, okay, this is health and wellness check-in minute. Anybody need to say anything? Anybody need to express anything? You can say it now if it's a small group, or you can drop it in the private chat, or you can put it in an email to me. But if there's something that you are that concerns you regarding your own physical, emotional, men, uh, um, basic needs, health, this is a space, a cognitive moment, when we're going to explicitly say, we care about this. And I do it at the beginning, uh, at beginning of my slideshow, it's, it's a slide that just says health and always check in. And then I sit silently for a minute. I love that. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'll also say I just got this uh, camera, I mean, this uh, light for my laptop. Um, so I'm going to try it out this weekend. Um, drop me an email or hit me up if you're curious. This was really cheap, so we're testing it um, at the TLPDC. It just clips right onto the top of my laptop. So I'll let you know. Yeah, I would also add, just because I'm a gearhead, I, <laughs> I'm a musician, right? When I realized I wasn't going to get back to campus, I took a bunch of my stage gear. So I'll be, I'll just do a funny here. And yes, friends, my, my uh, mic stand for my light is in fact a wine bottle. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that, Chris. <laughs> Not so far. <laughs> All right, I'm checking in the chat. We have such good suggestions and ideas. 
Um, we have a couple of people talking about Google, Google Jamboard. I've been hearing that recently from folks. Um, I'm going to put Courtney Myers on the spot. And Courtney, would you chime in and just talk about that for a minute? Because I know it is your favorite thing. It's definitely my recent favorite thing. Um, so I, my class, I had um, planned on students either coming in person or, or just doing work online and not Zooming. Well, then as the semester's progressed, I've had some students who need to not come to class and they really wanted to still participate. So I found Google Jamboard. Um, it's free. I put the links on Blackboard, and so the students can go to Blackboard and access the link. And it's anonymous, but I really just wanted to use it as discussion. I'm having trouble hearing them when they speak through their masks. And so it does allow them to provide some feedback, some input, and it's been um, a really great tool that I, somebody else posted, like, Google Jamboard's my new jam, and that's kind of how I feel about it. <laughs> Thanks, Courtney. I appreciate that. I've got Thanks. one. Friends, okay. I'm sorry, I've got one. Uh, just uh, Courtney's Jamboard reference reminded me. Something that I used, I've actually used prior to COVID in collaborating with a colleague with whom I'm co-writing a book is a shared Google Doc because he and I can be sitting on different continents and actually seeing one another's edits as if it was on an, a whiteboard or on an LED. What I've also discovered, and this is a recommendation that I think Sarah Brinker and I both ran across at the same time, is the idea of assigning a text, some kind of text-based Google Doc to students in a given breakout room and allowing them to work collaboratively in critical line readings or whatever. And while they're in the breakout room, I don't even have to barge in visually. I can just enter the document and see where they're at which is, seems much, one of the things I find about, about Zoom is that it's always kind of like, I always kind of feel like they or I are uh, at the beginning of the usual suspects, like, ah, uh, it's a lineup, right? So if I can just sort of peer over their shoulders at the Google Doc, it's much less invasive. And it gives me a, a good idea of how they're operating in a small seminar setting. Let me offer our um, presenters, our panelists, um, a moment perhaps to wrap up our thoughts as we end the near of our time, the, as we end, come to close to the end of our time. There we go, I'll get my words out. Um, so maybe we'll go in the same order um, as we went and just offer a few thoughts to close out our wonderful discussion. Melinda, I'm putting you on the spot then. Well, I really, um... Again, as I said earlier, I appreciate the opportunity to really think about this in a more, uh, to spend some more time thinking about how my teaching has changed in order to talk with you today. And I've really appreciated all the things that Chris and Justin have said, and I've taken a lot of notes. So that's going to be good. There's going to be a lot of new things that I'm now going to be able to incorporate. And so I appreciate your thoughts um, as well. And I think just, I think that all three of us have tried to really focus on our students and figure out what it means to be an effective teacher, recognizing what's happening in the world around us. And I think that's a big takeaway that I've just gotten from this whole experience and then also from hearing what my colleagues have said today. Justin? Yeah, I'm really struck still by Melinda's opening point about authenticity and uh, kind of modeling humanity and empathy. Um, and I've, I've tried to do that. I'm sure I've fallen short in some places. Um, but I, I find that um, I feel very differently just, uh, for example, about um, students saying that they are sick. <laughs> um, it's something that uh, we've all gotten those excuses. And I used to try to parse out, you know, which ones are the real ones and which ones are the BS ones. And I've just sort of given up on that. I, I, I just don't care anymore. If they need more time on an assignment, they need more time on an assignment. Um, I will say uh, this just happened on Wednesday. I had a sort of a check-in moment with my students um, in the way that I did. I got uh, in the feedback on my course evaluations in the spring, I uh, 
I had with both of my classes sort of, a, I, I didn't really teach class much that Thursday when class was canceled. What I did is I said to them, what questions do you have about what's going on in the world and how are you feeling about things? Um, and what do you want this class to be moving forward? And on course evaluations, I got a lot of comments saying, thank you for asking us, you know, what we're going through. Nobody else did that. And so I did that again on Wednesday and our students are struggling um, this semester. The dorms are a mess, um, which is frankly not being fully acknowledged, um, I think publicly, um, but the dorms are a mess and uh, students are um, not really trusting the um, sort of everything they're hearing. And I think that um, that they're not trusting the numbers the university is putting out. They, they are um, anxious and nervous, um, and many of them, as has been pointed out, are sick. Um, and so uh, I, th I think uh, the uncertainty of the spring continues now. Thank you, Justin and Chris. Um, I'm reminded I'll find the reference at another time of, of a list of dictates that the poet Gary Snyder put forth when he took over as the arts officer from the state of California. And the first thing he said is, own your mistakes. So speak honestly and transparently. My students continue to teach me to own my own sadness and fear and anger. And to recognize that owning my own sadness and fear and anger allows them to do the same, it, whether it should or not, it seems to give them permission to do that. Um, I saw what I was, when I was trying to read the Zoom room, I saw the thousand yard stare this week. This fourth week of the semester is when I, I think of it as my students in my clientele now look emotionally exhausted. And I think we have to own that, not just they have to own it. Like, oh, you, you know, feel what you feel. That's easy. That's easy as a dictate. I think we have to own the realities that Justin is speaking about and that Melinda has spoken about. And if we, the, to whatever extent we can own them, owning them permits us to speak toward their repair. Happy talk is a lie, and I won't lie to them. In our chat, you might have noticed that uh, George just said, uh, we have amazing role models and mentorship um, with Chris, Melinda, and Justin. And I think that's the way to end our talk today. I'm so appreciative of this conversation, of uh, the great conversation in the chat. So thank you to our panelists. Um, yeah, thank you. So you have a break now. Stand up, stretch, breathe, uh, eat lunch, and come back. Join us at one o'clock, same Zoom link. Won't it be interesting now to listen to the student perspective? I cannot wait to hear them.